we live in very uncertain times right now. Um, and that is true for all of us. And it's also true for, for global business and business leadership. And what this means for, for, for global business and leadership in general, we will discuss with uh, our next guest, Blair Shepard. Blair Shepard is the global leader for strategy and leadership for the global PwC network. He's also Professor Emeritus and Dean Emeritus of Duke University's Fukuoka School of Business. And Blair recently published a, an excellent book called 10 Years to Midnight, in which he argues that the world today faces four urgent crises and that we only have about 10 years to find answers to them and, and implement those. Welcome, Blair. Good to uh, have you. to be here. Thank you. And I look forward to the conversation with everybody. Uh, Blair will be interviewed by Shukri Tofi. Shukri is an entrepreneur, an investor, a film producer, speaker, and the co-founder of Fort, a media production company based in Johannesburg, South Africa. He holds degrees in law and politics and an executive MBA. He is an entrepreneurship expert at Said Business School at the University of Oxford. And he is, of course, also a young global changer and currently one of our program ambassadors. And with that, welcome Blair Shepard and Shukri Trophy, and I'm looking forward to your conversation. Thank you so much. So Blair, to, to kind of start off with, I, you know, I think there's so many um, bodies of knowledge that we could draw on that you've written and been a part of over the years. Um, but to start specifically around leadership, and you know, over the years I've heard you say that you know, curiosity and empathy are some of the hallmarks of, of good leadership, in, particularly in uncertain times. Um, and you've more recently um, come out with the six paradoxes of leadership that you think is absolutely crucial for us to, to take note of. Maybe yeah. just as a sort of context setter, could you give us sort of some of the thinking and logic behind thinking about paradoxes as a guide for leadership um, today? So, so I think the thing we have to look at is the characteristic of the challenges and opportunities we're grappling with today, right? Um, and and they, there, there are these trite phrases, but they're actually accurate, right? So, so it turns out that the issues we're grappling with are more complex, meaning they have more component parts to them, right? Um, there's, they're interdependent so that you, you can't really solve one without worrying about the other at the same time. So they're systems based in a way, right? Um, uh, they're more ambiguous. And so it's, it, it, it's harder to know whether or not what you're about to do is the right answer because in a lot of cases, we're dealing with something we've never dealt with before, right? So we've never tried to take CO2 equivalents out of our value chain, right? We, we, um, we have dealt with pandemics before, but not in your lifetime, right? We, in, in the kind we have. And so these are things that are coming up where actually we just don't know the answer. And so we're, we're making our best guess, but doing nothing is prohibitively expensive, right? Um, and then um, there are circumstances where there are many more constituents to the issues we're trying to solve. So it used to be the case that within PwC, for example, we had to worry about the regulator and our clients. Well, actually we have to worry about the general public. We have to worry about politicians. We have to worry about a whole series of regulators that aren't in our traditional kind of financial services area. And so consequence is the leadership challenge is radically different and therefore the kind of leader we need is also radically different. The key piece to it at the heart of the argument is that um, you have to be able to do things that feel mutually contradictory, right? Um, and because of that, typically people are good at one side of it and not at the other because we tend to do the things we like and know well, um, but you gotta be good at both. And, and so that's at the core of the argument. There's specifics behind each one, but, but that's the basic case. Okay. So, I mean, I think it's interesting. And for those people, perhaps, whose uh, English is not their first language, we, we're dealing very basically with contradictions, right? Or yes. seeming, seemingly contradictions. So if we drill down into a few of them, for example, a globally minded localist, right? Which I think is interesting in a world in which we've kind of um, had to stay in our homes, if we could, and yet we're even more connected through kind of uh, Zoom calls. And even though Blair, you and I have met face to face at different times, we're able to have this conversation right now with me in South Africa and you in the United States. Yeah. So thinking about a globally minded localist, it sort of got me thinking, especially for young people, what opportunities do you think uh, the gig economy or a more connected world provides to young people um, in different parts of the world 
to be to be more connected while still being relevant in their respective markets. So let's start with localists first, by the way, and then come back to global demand, right? Because I think there's an important piece here, which is if you think about some of the things that the world's not doing very well, right? So disparity in wealth is a huge issue around the world, um, both across regions and within regions, right? Um, and across generations. Another thing is not doing well, we're not doing all that good a job of sort of allowing small business to thrive and COVID's made it worse, right? Um, we're not addressing climate. Um, we aren't addressing the unintended consequences of technology. And so what you're seeing is that regional disparity is accelerating at a faster rate than individual and even intergenerational disparity is. So, so the, the problem we're gonna have is that the world will be composed of very, very, very successful locations with massive amounts of wealth in those locations and the rest of the world in some real challenge, both within countries and between countries. And, and, and turns out the problem with that is, let me give you an analogy. Imagine we had an Olympics where there was only two athletes who actually ever qualified to compete. It'd be pretty boring. We're kind of getting there in the world of the economy, right? Which is there are fewer and fewer places being massively successful. So what we have to do is have an ethos, and this is particularly true in the world you live in, Shikri, which is we have to have an ethos that says, Every village needs to thrive. Every community needs to thrive. Every town needs to thrive. And then we build a global connectivity on thriving local communities. So the key piece in the story is you've got to be focused on building thriving local economies first and then globalize, right? So, so the danger is if you think about technology as a way to allow you to connect to the world, and it allows you to be a player in wealth creation, the risk is that you succeed and don't bring the rest of your community with you. So two pieces of advice for people building businesses in the world today with, in an interconnected world. First one is um, remember where you come from, love a place and take care of it. And the second is realize that actually there are many things in which we're interconnected and there's a lot of capability in places other than your own you can bring to bear on the challenges you have in your own local community. So it is a case of globally minded localists where what we used to teach when I was in business school is a locally aware globalist. We've actually flipped the need in a very important way. I think it's an interesting one. And as you rightfully say, being in South Africa, where it, it you know, I think you bring up sort of asymmetrical growth, which you spoke about in your ADAPT system. And yes. South Africa is a great example of a deeply unequal society. Um, yes. Brazil is another and things like that. And I think, you know, I think it's, um, there's a greater obligation from a, besides strategically, but from a leadership perspective to say, it's actually unsustainable for only me to win when yes. the people that are at the bottom of this upside down pyramid, um, it's a very tenuous thing. Um, and therefore, um, ethical leadership really comes to the fore. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing that's important in that is that you have to recognize that the community you live in determines the quality of life you're going to have. You, you cannot build a gate high enough, right? You cannot isolate yourself enough. And by the way, why would you? Why would you want to, right? I mean, um, and, and, and that's where you end up going, right? You actually want to spend time in the town with the community of people you know and like. You want to be part of the community. And so the only way that works is if everyone thrives. And, and so I think where you're in particular is an example of, for you to be successful and not bring the community with you is a massive mistake, yeah. right? Therefore, worry about the community first. I, I, you could say that's ethical. One of the interesting things about the paradoxes of leadership in, in diversity, for example, is it's in your self-interest to worry about diversity. It's in your self-interest to worry about community. So you can be a rabid self-interest human being and the principles still apply. It, now, if you're, if you're ethical, it, it's easier to do, but, but it, the, the, it's, um, it's important today to think, to realize that it's in everyone's interest to do the sorts of things we describe, both in the book and related to the paradoxes. And, and I think that's really important, particularly for young people when we are often just driven blindly by our own kind of getting that degree, you know, um, moving forward to that particular level in your place of work and things like that. So I think it's an interesting thing to think of self-interest uh, and those things being able to coexist um, as part of that. Um, I mean, one more question on this is, you know, the, the idea of a competitive advantage, right? So for example, in, in South Africa, if we, in sporting terms, 
if I really wanted to be an amazing ice hockey player, I should probably move to Canada, right? Yes. Rather than stay in South Africa. If I wanted to be a rugby coach, I could stay in South Africa because we would have some real competitive advantages. What do you think the more traditional kind of economic policy around competitive advantages and what role does that play in the context of a globally minded localist? So, so the notion of comparative advantage is sort of one of the two truisms in economics, right? Sort of uh, um, supply and demand is the other, right? Um, and and the, the, the core argument is um, let every locale do the thing it does best. Don't do the things you're not going to, even if you're better, even, even if I was better at, um, at soccer than you, because I grew up in Canada, I should play ice hockey, right? Um, and, and, uh, and the world is better off. Well, that's, that's true and it's still true. The challenge is the following issue, which is that we have things like network effects and economies in scope and scale that are aggregating more and more of the comparative advantage to fewer and fewer organizations and fewer and fewer locations. So, so it turns out the problem is what you can't have is a circumstance where most cities and most communities and most villages have no relative advantage in the world at large, which is what's occurring, right? So the simple illustration of that is Apple traded at the FTSE 100 plus $500 billion two weeks ago. That's massive concentration of wealth, right? And, and, and power and influence. And so you kind of have to say, Comparative advantage only applies when you've got reasonable success at a local level. So we go back to the sports analogy. The way to fix the Olympics problem is to have a great local clubs who then compete within their geography, who then compete nationally, who then compete in the Olympics. But you got to build the local clubs first, right? If you don't have any local clubs, you have no sports. If you don't have thriving local communities, you don't have a global economy. So comparative advantage assumes that cities are doing okay to begin with, that's less and less true. So, so it, it, it's a paradox, which is in order to have global connectivity, we need strong local first, right? Or, or, or a conundrum, what feels like a conundrum, but um, so, so we had it before and therefore it was easy. Now we're actually driving it away. So if we, if we sort of change tact a little bit and move to the strategic executor, um, you know, for me, and I think many of the young people would perhaps uh, concur with this, is we live in a world with many great plans, but we sad, sadly fall short in the execution of these plans. And yes. I'm sure in all your years of experience, you've seen many great plans, but not the people with the ability to take action and actually build a coalition of the willing to actually drive these actions forward. Um, how do we follow through on these great plans and strategies better in the context of a strategic executor? So actually, I think you need to go a couple of the other paradoxes to actually deal with that question and then come back to the strategic ex executor, right? So, so one of them is a uh, humble hero. So, so let me give you an example related to, um, so everyone, if you would, on the call, think about the person you felt managed COVID brilliantly. Just have a name in mind and a face, have a person in mind, get one, okay? Now, I bet two things about that person. Here's the first one, that they were humble enough to know they didn't know enough about COVID to take a decision while getting massive amounts of input. They, they, they talked to a, a, a epidemiologist, they talked to public health officials, they talked to business leaders, they talked to leaders of civil society, they talked to politicians, they probably talked to the average citizen, and they even likely talked to psychologists about what's going to persuade people and not persuade people, right? And when they got there, I promise you, they had no idea what the right answer was because there wasn't a right answer, right? There were, there were choices that seemed better or worse, but there was no obvious right answer. And so they were humble enough to seek the input, but courageous enough to take a decision in times of serious ambiguity, right? That, um, now ask yourself, how many people are humble and heroic in the same person? Stories of hero heroism don't tend to have humility at the heart of them. And one of the problems with people who are, who are kind of inclusive and humble is that they, they, they can never get off and take a decision because the next, the last person in the room was the one they listened to, right? So, so the issue is uh, they had the courage and then they had humility to realize that they were probably wrong. The challenge is when they took the decision, because it was ambiguous, they were going to be massively criticized. Every single person who took a decision in COVID at any point in time has been massively criticized. And, but they were heroic enough to take the decision anyway, knowing that inaction was worse than an imperfect decision. 
and that the criticism came with a job, right? And then they were humble enough to understand they were wrong and change it. So that's attribute one, humble hero. Attribute two is that they were technically very sophisticated. They, they could understand the math behind epidemiology. They can understand the, the various kinds of, of uh, vaccines and what works and doesn't work. They can understand kind of the public health questions. And so they were technologists, right? But, but they also understood what made human systems work and people work. So what, what happened is they, they knew what kind of was the right thing to do, but they knew how to make it work in their societies or their businesses. The challenge is that many people are really good at people, right? But terrible at technology are really good at technology don't understand human systems. Ask yourself, how many people have an electrical engineering degree or a PhD in biology and also studied psychology, sociology, and political science? And how many people who study the humanities actually are good at technology? We needed people who are both and the best leaders are both. So, so Shukri, if you understand that, the way you execute is by using the other five paradoxes, by reconciling them. The reason strategic executor comes in to your point is the following, which is the world is coming so fast that if I can't deliver the goods, I won't have a job tomorrow. And if I can't deliver the goods, the world's passed me by. So I've got to make it happen. So. How many people have, you know, there's two nations in the world that have delivered on the Paris, on the Paris Climate Accords, two nations. Total population of those two nations is 60 million people. Trivial success. Everyone promised, no one delivered, right? Um, you can go from problem to problem to problem. What you see is lots of cool ideas, no execution. Now, the reason you need to be strategic as an executor is you're solving a problem today, but you got to solve in a way that sets you up to be successful tomorrow. And tomorrow's very different than today. So you got to understand what you're building toward. So I'll give you an example in leadership development. Most organizations develop leaders for the problems they have today, which means they have the wrong leaders by the time they get to tomorrow. So we've got to understand what we need in the future to be building it now. And so you've got to be good at execution, but you got to bring the future into the current problem set. So we're on the 20 minute mark um, and I see one or two people sort of um, uh, coming through with a few questions. So I'm going to give um, anybody else that have more questions. I've got two from, we've got one from Yelena and one from Yevgen. But before we do that, I think just to kind of bring everybody onto the same page, I want to just quickly read through the six paradoxes of leadership. So you have sort of some semblance of what that is. And and Blair, I'm not going to be doing, I'm not going to be butchering it or trying to give any sort of um, explanation to it without your input. But it is um, very simply put uh, the globally minded localist, a high integrity politician, a humble hero, strategic um, executor, tech savvy humanist, which I think we've touched on a little bit now as well, and then a traditioned innovator, which um, I have a few more kind of questions around that, but I think it might be. Um, add to the richness of, of the conversation if we bring uh, more people into the conversation. Is there anything at this point you want to posit to us, Blair, before we um, uh, go to some of the questions? Uh, no, so Shukri, I would like to go back to tradition in there because it's a really important one. It's not obvious, but 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 let's let's take questions because I I'd rather be useful for this group than just uh, opine because um, I love listening to others and not hearing myself talk. So love to hear the questions. Absolutely, so I promise we'll we'll leave some time for 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 wrapping on that. I think it'll be good for us as uh, young people, quote unquote, um, to have a sense of exactly what that idea is. So um, Yelena, I'm gonna. Um, who I've met a number of times. So Yelena, um, over to you. What is your question? Hello. So hello, Blair. Hello, hello Yelena. Uh, as you were talking about this conundrum of being both uh, humble and heroic, it struck me that I heard it one more time before uh, when I was listening to John Mendes, who writes extensively on CIA, uh, because she was talking about that's exactly the profile of people that they are hiring to be spies because people need to be kind of uh, heroic enough to save the world, but humble enough not to talk about it ever. And I find it interesting that also it's a basic requirement to be a good spy. Uh, we've had leaders around the world who were former spies and it's not always working out so well. 
Yeah. I don't know if uh, <laughs> everybody will agree with me, but I have some examples in mind. So how do you uh, manage to actually uh, find people who are both humble and heroic, but how do you sift through those people who are humble and heroic, but who are also suitable to be leaders uh, in the public sphere? Yeah, so, so the first thing is I would say uh, any paradox alone is not what we need in a leader. We need them to be able to reconcile all six. And most of the leaders who were spies originally that actually aren't successful as leaders, and I won't name them, you can pick your favorite person, right? Um, um, in the country I live in now, I was a Canadian originally, but the country I live in now, George Bush Sr. was a spy before he became president, right? And there were some real liabilities in what he did as a leader, for example. But um, I think what you want to do is look at how do they do with the other attributes. And there's sort of two in particular that I think get in the way for them, right? Maybe three. The first is high integrity politician. So, so, so here's the reason it matters today. Um, and, here, and, and you can figure out which one they're not all that good at, right? So, so the first thing is that actually, um, because there are so many constituents that are relevant to every problem we're trying to solve today, you have to be massively inclusive in the way you get things to occur, which means you've got to negotiate, you've got to form coalitions, you've got, you've got to bring people on board, you've got to persuade them, right? Um, oftentimes, the spy doesn't have the patience for being political because they, they just, they, they've had to be uh, isolated alone and in the closet, and therefore, that's not a natural skill. The second piece of, of high integrity politician, though, is that actually it doesn't work if you lose your core. If you forget kind of the ideals and the principles and the values that drove you to want to get the outcome in the first place, you can actually have a great, you can have a decision that works, but actually you've lost your center, you lost the original intent. And particularly in a day like today, if you don't have the integrity, people won't rally around you. You can't get the meeting convened in the first place, right, except by force. And so one thing is that the lifestyle of a spy works against building that capability set, right? Um, the, the second piece I think is, um, is, a, is kind of the tradition to innovator, right? So here's what I mean by that. In, in many new organizations, they say break it first and build it. The problem with breaking it first is you're bringing nothing to the future. And, and there are things about the world we have today that are good that you don't want to lose. So what you have to do is understand what's special, what's unique, what's really important to the thing you're leading and protect that at all costs and then change everything else, right? So, so let me use as that the example of the CEO of Pfizer, right? What he did brilliantly was say, the one thing we will not touch is the drug development process that would pass the most rigorous standard for um, the validity of a, of a pharmaceutical, because that's core to who we are. And, and actually what he said is we're going to be even stronger than any agency would require, but we'll change everything else. He changed the, they, they brought multiple drugs to, uh, to test at the same time. They manufactured ahead of finishing the product. They did all sorts of things that were breaking the rules of drug development, except the core one, which is what do we need to do to ensure the public that actually the drug is safe? So he understood what was core and what was tradition to what he had, but then changed everything else. The challenge with many spies is they either want to change everything or they don't want to move off the dime of who they are. They're, they're, I become a spy because I believe in the thing I represent. And so it's hard for me to change it, right? I'm too embedded in tradition. Uh, and, and so those two, I think, become particular weaknesses in the circumstance you describe. But if you use that broadly, Elaine, what you see is leaders have to be good at all six of the paradoxes. They can't just be good at one. It, it, it's a uh, the example for me in this is there's a wonderful book that talks about why Roger Federer was a great tennis player. And the answer is he had no weaknesses. You couldn't beat him at the net. You couldn't beat him with a spin shot. You couldn't beat him with a lob. You couldn't beat him with, with uh, back baseline play. Couldn't beat his backhand. Couldn't beat his forehand. Couldn't beat his serve. And, and so he played against the two people. One of them had a massive backhand. The other one had a massive serve. Eventually, he wore them down by playing to their weakness. 
the life we live in today will find our weakness really fast. We've got to be good at all 12. So my answer is, if you have a spy who's good at the other five paradoxes, they're going to be a good leader. If not, they're going to be a bad leader. So um, I'm going to, I have something to say about that, because uh, just around the fact that I think we, um, and we, we chatted about this in the, before we get to Yevgen, is that you perhaps need well-balanced teams rather yes. than well-balanced individuals, right? Because it's a yes. little bit, you know, a little bit intimidating to say you can have no weaknesses, but I think one needs to uh, have the lofty goal of minimizing your weaknesses as an organization or a team. As a team. So Shikri, th this is an important point, which is I know one person who I think is great at all 12 and they can also fly and they can go through buildings. Right. I mean, they can't, but they but it feels like that to me. They're perfect. Right. I, I know one person who does that. Right? And, and, and it's scary to know that person. Right. The rest of us are just human beings. So what it means is we have to compose a team that's strong at all 12 things. Right. Now, here's the here's the issue, Shikri. The thing you're bad at, you're bad at because you don't care about it, right? If you liked it, you'd do it and therefore you'd be good at it, right? So what you have to do for the person who particularly is good at the thing you're not good at is you gotta love the thing you hate. That's a hard thing to do, right? But, but um, and back to self-interest again, a lot of reasons why people think we need diversity is it's in the public good. Actually you need diversity because if you're not diverse, you won't succeed. Uh, it, it, at least as it relates to the 12 attributes of a successful leader. Okay, so we've got two, two more questions coming in. So I'm going to say just in the interest of time, because we've got about 10 minutes left, if we could keep the questions to like 30 seconds, very, very uh, global solution style of- And I'll be faster with my answer. I'll be faster with my answer. It's short, it's short yeah. and pointed. Uh, Yevgen, go for it. You, I think you, might, you may be muted. Uh, no more. There you go. Uh, dear Shurke, dear Blair, my pleasure to see you again. Normally we meet in Berlin, but this time online. Good to see you. Yeah, two years uh, ago, I participated at the Petra Draka competition and we spoke about strategy and leadership. I would like to ask you, Blair, about your personal experience. Looking back in your experience, do you think that you are a good leader and what would you learn uh, the next? So I actually never thought of myself as a leader, by the way. I mean, I get asked the question a lot, what makes you a good leader, right? And, and it, they would say, well, your track record shows you are. I never thought of myself as a leader. Um, and, and part of the reason is, uh, that's important is, the danger in talking about leadership is it's an egocentric exercise if we do it wrong, right? And good leaders aren't egocentric. Um, so to me, I think the important point, if I were to look back over my own career is, I just saw the next obvious problem and figured out what to do with it. And I cared deeply about the people who worked with me and for me. Um, and, and so to me, if you go back and say, what are the things if I reflect on when I was at my best, it was, there was a thing that needed to get done and I found a way to get it done. And, um, and I cared deeply about the people. So what I wanted was for them to be the best version of themselves on their terms, not mine, right? Um, and now the, the point to that is that those two features, if you do them right, actually help you be good at the paradoxes, right? So, so they're, they're not separate, they're related. Right? So if I said, um, what are the things that I still need to work on, right? Um, I think there's two that I'm particularly worried about. Um, one of them is that technology has gone from kind of the general trends of platforms dominating life. And I kind of understand that pretty well. Thought about that a lot to uh, sector specific and problem specific technology that's related to what does it mean to work this issue in particular, right? So it turns out in drug development, it's, it's uh, how do you model DNA uh, or RNA, and then how do you produce it? That's, a, that's not going to a platform, it's very specific. It's, so every problem in every sector is increasingly got technology is unique to it. Uh, I'm trying to figure out how to stay on top of that so I can remain relevant to uh, advising on strategy, right? That's a hard thing because it's getting more and more specific, actually. The second one is um, in the medium we now use, it's hard to empathize with the world. So when I was traveling all the time, I kind of knew what it was like in South Africa at a given moment in time because I'd just been there a month earlier or India or China or 
or somewhere in Europe, right? And um, or Russia, because I, I mean, I, I went all over the world, right? And um, today I'm sitting here in my own home. And and when we were, uh, when, when COVID was at its zenith in the United States, we were at our beach house looking at the ocean with my two sons and our granddaughters. Um, beautiful place, got to walk the sand every day. Um, and, and we had three PhDs and a, and a quadruple, four PhDs and a quadruple degree sitting in a house. Turns out that's not the real world, right? And so the question is, what does it mean to understand and empathize and know someone else's, what's happening on their terms when you can't be there? Um, and, and I'm trying to figure that one out, doing the best I can, but it's really, really hard. Well, I think having conversations like these is a start. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that, that empathizing process. So, um, uh, Edward, I don't know, you, you've, you've put it on, but we're happy to, to hear your voice and let you enter the conversation as uh, uh, over to you. Oh, thanks. I, I, I wasn't able to unmute it at the beginning. Um, yeah, first of all, just say there you again i met you in berlin a few years ago as well and um, so very quickly yeah very quickly and um, this humble hero this humble hero leader idea um i wonder how is he or she to deal with the narrative that one which seems to ignore the complexity of the unknown and i think if, if too many leaders feel pushed into following the science, so to speak, that the diversity of exploring really challenging solutions may actually be stymied rather than helped. Yeah, so, so um, let's go to that one in particular after, and that's about technology savvy humanists, by the way, but, but in the humble hero piece, the key issue is to recognize you don't know and get inputs from lots of sources and realize how complicated the question is, right? So, so um, the piece of humility says, don't assume you know, and, and therefore go seek lots of input, right? And, and every problem I know has that characteristic. There's nothing that we're working on PwC that's simple anymore, right? And so uh, there's something I missed. And, and so there's this issue in, in the implication of humility, which is, the awareness that you got to ask another group the next question, right? But you can't. But you got to do that really fast. You got to be efficient in how you do it because you got to get to an answer, right? Um, so the answer needs to be informed by as broad a perspective as you possibly can, and then you have to take a decision. Uh, so, so I think the danger, to your point, is we use we we banty a phrase like science way too loosely, right? Having studied the philosophy of science my entire life, it's not so precise. <laughs> Right? And, um, and actually when we say it's science led, we're deceiving ourselves because what it really is, our best judgment given the best science we have and a lot of other input, right? And as so we get leaders to think that way, they'd be better off because they could then take on the question about what about this, what about this, what about this, right? So if you come to that, I think the important point is it's not enough to know technology. You gotta know human beings and human systems and how people work. And one of the dangers is that a scientist will say, well, I'm right, therefore you must do it. And as a citizen, I say, frankly, I don't care. I would say something less polite than that, but I'm talking to good and decent people. You can imagine what would go through my head, right? I just don't care what you have to say. Um, if you don't understand my issues, you don't understand where I'm coming from, I'm not gonna follow you. So we need people, it's not enough to know the science. But if you get people who don't understand the science, you're gonna make a stupid decision, right? So you, you, you have to put them together and have a more sophisticated understanding of the problem. Um, and if you do that, you'll be more able to withstand the criticism you get from either side. The scientists will criticize you. The, the pure play math guy will criticize you. One will criticize you. The pure play person who says, you just don't understand the world I live in. And you'll be better positioned because you'll consider all those views. Tough, tough, by the way, but you got to do that really fast and really well. I'm going to take uh, one more question um, from Dr. Fontip Wacharapun. Um, so if we could unmute her, that would be great. Thank you. 
Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay, so I have just uh, a, really, a really short question. So uh, when we come to the hard decision and we try to compare both uh, the drawback and benefit, but we still can't find a way to uh, which, which choice we should choose, do you have suggestion? Uh, how could we know that? What should be the right choice for us? So, so this is, I mean, unfortunately, we're you're welcome to the 21st century with your question, right? There is no obvious answer. Um, and, and I think this is a, sort of two pieces on this. One of them is, if you accept the notion that there is no right answer because we're doing things for the first time, what you have to realize is your job is to make your best first guess and then iterate over time to get closer and closer to the right answer. Right. Um, so if you think about one of the things that happens with COVID, for example, is because people might have been really humble in the first case and, and took really good decisions, they didn't keep their ear to the ground. They didn't keep talking to people. So they missed that the world had moved. Right. And so it was the right answer for three months, but the wrong answer when the circumstances had changed. And so part of it is you've got to think about strategy as a dynamic journey rather than a decision we make that we then execute and stay with forever, right? The core idea may remain the same, but it's much more dynamic. So if you accept the premise that no answer is perfect, I'm going to give my best guess, and you keep your ear to the ground and you do essentially the answer I gave Edward on a continuous basis, then what happens is you iterate to the right answer. If you think you're gonna get right in the first place, you'll freeze and never take a decision and, and I promise you that's worse because nothing today is radically expensive, right? So, so be imperfect and improve. And, and, and unfortunately, what that means, Vandeep, is that, is that you're gonna get criticized. By definition, you're gonna get criticized with whatever answer you get. So, so realize that you've gotta do it in a way which is politically sophisticated. So you're there tomorrow to make the adaptation you have to make. So, which is why high integrity politician is part of the answer. You, you've got to have your constituents with you or you'll get to the middle of the intersection in the change you're trying to drive and you'll be kicked out of your job and then nothing will happen. So survive till tomorrow in order to do the adaptation. So I, um, with, with a few minutes going, I just want to um, concur with that and say, I mean, I think if you, if your your view on your, on your if your lens on the world is that we're in this complex system with things constantly changing, um, and you truly believe in multiple perspectives, then verily you are wrong. And at from someone's perspective, um, at all times, and it's for me, it's also sometimes in leadership a question of being less wrong um, and iteratively taking those steps on the yes. information that you have in front of you. So. Um, so, so Blair, I mean, just to kind of, um, Navam, do you want to, do you want to make a very quick, short and sharp before we, before we wrap, I see you have a, a cybernetic approach to decision-making question, or is that just a, a, a comment that you want to do, put out there? Oh, uh, no, I just, just, uh, just wanted to realize, I mean, I just wanted to, if you're familiar with it, I mean, that's something we kind of studied in decision-making, uh, it's very, you know, you make small decisions. And then depending on the feedback you get from different constituents and different sources, you make incremental changes in that direction. So you yeah. don't make you know, commitments too far ahead. So I mean, uh, it's something we use in foreign policy uh, when we try to make those kind of you know, very significant decisions, but it can be applied to any decision-making environment. That, that's just a comment, thank you. Yeah, so a quick, a quick piece on that if I can, right? Um, I, I, the, the notion in the times when we can afford to sort of test the water, we should. There's a problem we have today, which is there are some problems that are massive and big and coming quickly. And so if you're going to iterate, if, if you're going to make a small step to learn and then grow, you better do it really fast. Right? And, and so I think the principle of cybernetics applies in the sense of, and actually it's good entrepreneurship, um, Shikri, so you get this world, right? You live it, which is you make your best guess. You know what's wrong, you find out what's wrong, you fix it. But you don't forget the core idea. This is an important point about tradition innovator. Remember what's core to what you're doing and don't lose that or else you just go from thing to thing to thing and you look completely um, uh, out of control, which is a lot of political leaders have done lately. They just go from pillar to post and never have a center. Right? But the challenge with cybernetics in the simple way, wade into the water, which is good advice whenever you go to a new lake is Climate and uh, massive job creation and things like it, we need right now. 
And so if we're going to iterate, if we're going to go small and then grow, we better do it really fast. And what we may have to do is actually go big and iterate, right? Um, and, and so agree with the premise and um, dot, 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 lots of comments after. So in closing, um, Blair and I, you know, I think we, the, the difficulty with, with these types of conversations and particularly for many of us who've been part of this community for a long period of time is we leave Berlin or we uh, click off this call and for people like Sinan or uh, Sarah or uh, Priyanka and people from all parts of the world on this call, if I just look around at like the people that are on this call, it's really difficult um, to kind of go there and build a little coalition of the willing to try and move things forward. So you often ask, how will you shape the world? Um, so in closing, what sort of personal agency do you think we have as young people to impact um, and make a real impactful change within the current structure that we have? So, so first of all, you have an incredible luxury, which is you know each other. Right? Um, and so if you can create a kind of shared view of the world you're trying to create, however imperfect that shared view is, and you act independently, then we'll actually see the world start to go there, right? Um, and so stay connected to each other and, and debate each other and build ideas. Second answer is find a place you love and make it better. Um, now it turns out the reason I trust that to create a coordinated answer is that almost every place in the world is sharing the same problems. We call them different things. They have different form, right? So um, the form of distrust in institutions in Europe and in, in Germany is different from the United States, is different from South Africa, is different from India. We still have it, right? The issue of small business succeeding is a different problem, but we still have it, right? The, the ways climate plays out is different. We still have it. The lack of inclusiveness is different, but we still have it. So if we actually find a place we love and make it better, then actually the world in aggregate will do well, right? Um, and then I think my third piece of advice is um, dream big. The world needs serious action on really serious issues. And what's kind of cool about that, so the, the last thought if I can, um, I'm gonna be a business dean for a minute. For the, first time in a long, 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 long time, what's in the interest of the shareholder is also in the interest of general society. Because the issues that I, I described in the book and we talked about are here and they're urgent. So they're material for every business in the world. Uh, therefore, if you, if you take on a thing and make it better with those in mind, in aggregate, the world will get better, but we gotta do it big and we gotta do it fast because Seriously, the reason we wrote the book is the three crises in particular, we've got a decade or the world goes really dark. So get to it, I think I would say. You know, you've been, you've, you've been young leaders, all, most of you have been young leaders for several years. Time to step up and change the world, folks, you know? So get to it. Okay, so awesome. I mean, I think there's so many, uh, we could carry on speaking for, for so much longer. So. I mean, just to kind of echo your call to action, let's get connected. Um, I think you guys can check out the six paradoxes of leadership on uh, Blair's social media platforms and also PwC and connect with me on LinkedIn and other platforms. Um, and a little takeaway that I love is find a place that you love and make it better. And, uh, and let's dream big and, and, and start to, to, uh, to, dent, to dent the world positively. So thank you so much for your time today. A real privilege to spend 45 minutes with you. And thank you very much for, to the Global Solutions team for, for making it happen. Thanks for uh, the questions. And it was good to see all of you again that I had seen before. And, and good luck with it, everybody.